Why can you put a thousand hours into a game or a sport and still be average or below average? Why is Simple considered the best Counter-Strike player of all time when other pros have put more hours into the game than him? And why is Michael Jordan looked at as the best basketball player of all time when he didn't even make the varsity basketball team, meaning he obviously started from behind? That's because later that night he locked himself in his room and cried, and from then on he didn't just want to make the varsity basketball team. He wanted to be good enough to make the varsity basketball team, and eventually wanted to be personally good enough to be the best basketball player in the world. That's the key. And that's called being conscientious. Where IQ is the biggest determining factor for how fast you learn a given task, your level of conscientiousness is the biggest determining factor for how good you can become at that given task over time. And fortunately for us, you can actually train yourself to be more conscientious. Now, fully understanding conscientiousness would take a rabbit hole of the video, which I would be interested in making if you guys wanted me to. But for this video, I'm going to be going over the must know parts about conscientiousness and the best ways to actually improve and break through plateaus by starting off debunking and fixing some widely spread myths about improving and training, identifying and isolating weaknesses, progressive overload, and then giving tangible examples and the theory behind breaking through physical plateaus and then doing the same for mental plateaus, which are arguably more difficult and way more important in my opinion. But before we get too deep, I do have two things I need to get out of the way. One, why should you listen to me? Now, I don't usually like throwing around credentials, but for this type of video, I think it's pretty necessary. So I have a minor in sports coaching from Auburn University. I'm also a licensed personal trainer, and I'm a certified strength and conditioning coach, meaning that I've studied human development and skill movements pretty thoroughly for quite some time now, and I'm taking what I know and applying it to the skill movements in gaming. And two, if you're not in the habit of liking and commenting, not just for my videos, but for any video that you enjoy, please do because it's easily the best way to help us out with the YouTube algorithm and get us exposure. And if you have any questions, comments, want advice, or just want to disagree with me in the comments, leave those in the comments below. And I also stream on Twitch almost every day, and I love talking about that stuff live there, and the link will be in the description. All right, so the first myth I want to talk about is that practice should be as close to the end game scenario as possible which is a very big part of developing the ability to actually perform in the game, it's not the best way to progress at the most basic level. So a skill movement is a combination of multiple smaller movements, which can then be broken down even further, but that branch uh, structure is the foundation for a skill movement. And multiple skill movements make up the moves that you actually perform in the game. So the problem is whenever you're combining all of those aspects together in practice, you begin to rely on the aspects that are better developed. Now, a lot of this is going to be cleared up when I talk about isolating and identifying weaknesses, but the best way I can explain it is this. If you only ever do heavy barbell squats, right, your quads make up the majority of what's being done, and then your butt muscle is going to help out a good bit, and your hamstrings help out whenever your quads and your butt can't perform the movement themselves. So if you don't force your hamstrings to recruit and you can do that, your quad can do the muscle, the movement itself, then it's going to. Meaning that as you get stronger, your hamstrings are going to get left behind. And when you eventually plateau and you stop progressing, then your hamstrings are too far behind to actually help. So when your quads and butt fail, your hamstrings can't make up the difference. So they actually never get any recruitment. But if you isolate the different muscles, developing your hamstrings and teach your hamstrings how to properly uh, recruit and help out, then you'll easily get better at the squat and start putting up more weight, right? Which is why I say training your tracking is so important to your aim. Because even if you track in game like 10% of the time, if your tracking can't keep up with the other aspects of your aim, then it's going to hold them back because it's never getting recruited and it can't help out anyway. So it's just not going to, and you're going to always have that plateau in the background that's going to stop you from improving. And the next myth I wanted to talk about is that practice makes perfect. And there are two things I want to say about this. So first of all, I agree that perfect practice makes perfect. I think that's a way better way to say that. The biggest mistake I see that people who are dedicated make when practicing is that they go balls to the wall and constantly try to do the most difficult task they can muster. Now the problem is that you start to develop bad habits for long-term improvement just so you can do better at this task now. And the best way I can explain it is this. When you're, when you're doing aim training and you have multiple targets to get to, instead of flicking perfectly to the target in a straight line with no hesitation, you'll flick in a circular pattern to try to get to the next target faster even though that's a bad form. Or you'll flick to the target just trying to get there quickly and you have to micro adjust heavily to get back to it just to fix that bad aim. When it would benefit you long-term to learn how to flick properly and perfectly to the target even if it's a little bit slower for now it's like learning how to shoot a deep three-pointer whenever your muscles can't do it properly so you come from a bad starting point a bad release point and your form all the way through is kind of messed up when you would have been better off just stepping in and learning how to shoot properly where in a few months or a few years whenever your muscles could do it you would have a great form to actually work with and be way better long term and the second thing I want to say is that whenever you practice and you're fixing your form properly you'll notice a dip in your performance for now 
And I'll talk about that when I talk about mental plateaus. But as you re retrain your synapses to perform the movement this new way, you're going to be way more efficient and better in the long term with this new form. Like personally, I went through this because I'm really good at flicking close to the target and then micro adjusting back to it. So over the past month, I've gotten worse because I'm trying to consciously flick perfectly to the target, even if it's slower. And I've only recently gotten back to the speed that I was originally at with the bad habit, but it's been a huge break in plateau and I can actually feel myself consciously improving because I don't have that bad habit holding me back. All right, now let's start digging into the meat of this. So let's talk about conscientiousness. It's one of the big five fundamental personality traits and it's the biggest determining factor for how good you can become at a given task over time. And in psychology, the blanket traits are the tendency to be responsible, organized, hardworking, goal-directed, and adhere to norms and rules. Now, those are pretty broad blanket terms, but we can break it down for improvement standards. And the biggest factors there are, deliber are being deliberate over your choices and actions, self-regulation so you can maintain your goals and keep moving towards them, and being honest and critical with yourself about strengths, weaknesses, and work with that knowledge to improve upon yourself. So someone who's not conscientious will go play deathmatch brainlessly, just filling time and not understand why they're not getting better. And a conscientious person will go play deathmatch and deliberately try to focus on something like trying to hit headshots. And they're not going to care about the end result. They're going to care about improving. And in turn, they will improve so much faster than the other. So how do you become more conscientious? Now, these come straight from Jordan Peterson. He's a clinical psychologist and an expert on the subject. I highly recommend checking him out if you wanted to learn more. Now, he says the best starting point is to make a plan and learn to use a calendar. But do it poorly at first. Make sure that the things you're setting out for yourself are not just things that you need to do, but that you're willing to do. Because through that, you learn to look at yourself in a critical light and be honest with yourself about strengths, weaknesses, and capabilities. And you learn to negotiate from there with yourself about what you should be doing to improve. And the other thing is to start giving yourself responsibility. This comes from the thought that you should wake up every morning and make your bed. Now, who cares about making the bed? It's kind of irrelevant. It's going to get messed up whenever you get back in the bed. But you're learning to take steps in the right direction and be productive working upon yourself. It could be responsibilities like getting your aim training done by 11 every morning or getting to the gym by 12 or even going to the gym at all. But learning how to self-regulate, be honest and critical of yourself, and being deliberate about your actions are the best way to start being conscientious. Now, if you can find ways to do this without making a plan, calendar, um, responsibilities is a tough one to do it without. But if you can find something that works for you to develop your conscientiousness, then do it. Because in turn, being more conscientious determines how good you can become at a given task over time, which is a big, big deal. Now, the reason that's so important is because being conscientious is a prerequisite to being able to identify weaknesses and then being able to isolate them from there. And this is rather complicated, so stick with me. So the best way to explain it is this. The best athletes in their field are able to realize what goes wrong at the moment that it happens, that split second. Like golfers can feel the ball come off of the club as soon as they hit it at the slightest wrong angle. Basketball players will notice that the ball rolls off of their middle two fingers instead of their middle and their index, or even that it's just weighted on one of those fingers a little too much. So you have to learn to analyze every tiny piece of your skill movement to see where the inconsistency is actually coming from. And from there, you can learn to isolate that movement and fix it. So Ray Allen, the best shooter of all time, to the point where he was almost robotic with his shot, he isolated his movements more than anyone I know. So whenever he did his form work, he would do this. He would start with one-handed shots going from pre or shot pocket to pre-release to follow through in a perfectly straight line. Then he would do the exact same thing with two hands without his legs, only using his upper body. And then he would use his legs and so on and so forth. But when you learn to segment your movement that much and each segment can perform the movement by themselves perfectly, that's when you become elite because each segment is able to actually notice the failures of the other and then be able to make up for the failure of the others from there because they know what it feels like to do the movement properly. And the most common ones I see in gaming are this. Almost everyone is a wrist and an arm aimer to some degree. The wrist performs the micro corrections and the arm does the flick, right? But when these two movements have to work together for a medium to long range flick, or medium to short range flick as well, there are so many variations of either segment messing up or performing it perfectly where the wrist or the arm doesn't know how to do the movement by itself. The arm may over flick or under flick and the wrist may do the exact same because there are so many variations of either segment messing it up or performing it perfectly. It takes an insane amount of hours to become consistent in that range. Because developing muscle memory with an inconsistent environment is too difficult because the muscles don't even know what movement they're supposed to be doing without the other muscle segment performing it perfectly. When in reality, you could speed that process up exponentially by teaching your wrist to perform longer flicks than it would ever need to by itself. 
and teaching your arm to perform smaller micro adjustments than it would ever need to by itself. That way, subconsciously, your body learns to exactly what it feels like for each segment to perform each movement by itself, and in turn, the segments, wrist and arm, learn to work together to hit that range consistently because your brain can instantly recognize where the inconsistency is coming from and make up for it in a split second. Sorry, it's rather complicated, but I hope I explained that well enough. If I didn't, let me know in the comments. All right, so we're getting more and more tangible. So now let's talk about the best ways to break through plateaus. So there are two types of plateaus. The ones where you're not being tested enough and you stop progressing because your body recognizes that you're performing the task good enough. So instead of getting better and better, you're getting better at performing the task the exact same way. So instead of getting better or worse, you're just constantly average by your own standards. We'll call this a physical plateau. And the other plateau is the one where your brain is focusing too hard on one thing, and as a result, your performance gets worse in other ways. We'll call this a mental plateau, but the telltale sign of this is when you feel like you're actually getting worse at whatever you're doing. Now, there can be some overlap between mental and physical plateaus, but they're usually pretty regulated by themselves. And the best way I found to break through both of these is a theory called progressive overload. Now, in the simplest form, it's just that you're doing more today than you did the day before. Uh, in weightlifting, it's instead of bench pressing 225 pounds like you did last time, you bench press 230 today. And then the next time you bench, you're going to be going for 235. So let's go ahead and get into the specifics of this. All right, now to break through physical plateaus, you have to realize what your goal is. If you're doing aim training and you're trying to get faster at flicking accurately, just adding more flicking tasks isn't going to do much for you if you're not actively trying to flick faster. This is where most people mess up. Like we talked about with conscientiousness, you have to be actively trying to improve because instead you're just training yourself to flick at the same accuracy and speed just for a longer period of time. Now, this is why aim lab works so well for me because the tasks aren't insanely difficult so i can focus on personally trying to go faster or more accurately without worrying about how difficult the task is and trying to keep up now although you can do both at the same time that's completely fine the surefire way to improve and break through a plateau is to isolate your speed and your accuracy now have time to set aside to for you to focus on flicking as fast as possible with no hesitation on your clicks and let your accuracy go to crap because you don't care about that right now. You're just focused on getting faster. And you should do the same for accuracy. Who cares about speed? Just get to the target with perfect form and click with no hesitation and go on to the next one. This could be anything from a few tasks a day where you do this or a full day or a week where you're doing one of these in isolation. But as you get better and they start to merge together, you'll break through that plateau and skyrocket. It's the same thing with learning a crossover in basketball, right? You can do the movement all day brainlessly, but if you're not messing up, you're not going hard enough. So you have to isolate it and then focus on it to break through those plateaus when they merge together. And then we have mental plateaus or mental blocks. Now these usually comes in terms of game sets. When you're working on your court vision, field vision, reading your mini map, learning to start doing callouts, or even learning to listen to callouts. But your brain can only focus on so much at a time. Multitasking is a myth. I'd actually encourage you to Google that. If you've never heard it before, it's actually quite interesting. But as you focus on one thing, you're taking away brain power from something else. And you mess up a shot, you get discouraged from that. And from there, your confidence goes down. It's a bad spiral down until you either get worse or you stop trying to improve. That's the plateau. But the reality of it is this. You're going to be worse until it becomes a subconscious action to analyze the information that you're trying to pick up on or perform the habit. Now, the more you look at the mini map, the more you're going to die from looking at the mini map until you die enough times that you start doing it fast enough and at the right times. That's where the plateau is. And that's why mental plateaus are so tough. The only way to improve is to get worse. It's like learning to breathe. You breathe now without even realizing it, and it takes up almost 0% of your brain power. And that translates to all habits, like learning to hit headshots or learning to react to a defender. Like you always just instinctually go for body shots. But if you train yourself to go for headshots and say, I don't even want the kill if it's not a headshot, you'll perform worse for now by far. But once that becomes instinctual, you'll break through those plateaus like wildfire and going for the headshot instead of just delegating yourself to body shots will become the new norm. Like if you always have a pre-programmed response to a defender in your brain, then you're never going to be able to react to him properly. You have to let yourself get worse, get the ball stolen, miss out on kills until it becomes instinctual to do the right thing. 
Now, this is a rather complicated topic, and I hope I explained everything properly. If I didn't, you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. I'll be glad to answer them there. Um, as always, make sure you leave a like, comment. That's the best way to support me. Subscribe to me if you like the content because we are coming out with more on the channel. I'm sorry I took so long to upload this one, but my Twitch channel is going to be in the description. Let me know in the comments below. Feel free to check me out, all that good stuff. Much love. Thanks for watching the video, guys. Thanks for spending this little bit of your day with me. But as always, much love and peace out. And I've been chilling, watching the ocean with you. Baby, up with a slow motion crew.